Hello and welcome to the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. Today's interview was an absolute treat for me with Mr. Mark Faber. Do you know who Mark Faber is? He really needs no introduction, but for those of you who don't know, he's a Swiss-based investor who resides in Thailand, someplace near and dear to my heart, and he's the publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report newsletter, and he's also acting as an investment advisor and fund manager and involved in a number of investment funds focused on emerging and frontier markets. I really enjoyed this interview. It was so insightful to learn from somebody who has watched global financial markets for as long as somebody like Mark has. We covered a lot in this conversation. It actually was really, really fun. We discuss his macro outlook for financial investments and go into detail on topics such as quantitative easing, gold, U.S. equities, real estate, and more. Before you listen, please don't forget to like or subscribe to the podcast, or even better, leave a review. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel and or like the video. This really helps more people find it, and I really appreciate it. Mark famously called the 1987 stock market crash and has been an investor for a very long time. Don't miss his keen insight on where the world could be going. Enjoy this episode with Mark Faber, Dr. Doom himself. Enjoy. Mark, I'm extremely excited to have you on today. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be a guest on your show. Awesome. Well, I know nearly all of my listeners know who you are. Um, You called the 1987 crash, uh, which was quite significant. Perhaps my favorite is uh, from a a good book, Tony uh, Robbins' Money Mastering the Game. You were uh, mentioned as Mark the billionaire they call Dr. Doom. Now you run gloomboomdoom.com <laughs> and have a fantastic newsletter. So uh, really welcome to the show. Thank you. You're currently in Chiang Mai, Thailand, correct? Correct, yes, I live here. Awesome, I'm also a big fan of Thailand. I lived in Bangkok for four years. So Chiang Mai is wonderful except for smoky season, but it's a, it's a wonderful little pocket, yes, that's for sure. That's- the drawback to smoky season. <laughs> yeah. So I definitely want to get into Asia and emerging markets and perhaps even Thailand. But um, yeah, I wanted to start off today with more of a macro outlook. Paint, paint me an overall picture of what's happening in the world because everybody just keeps saying it's unprecedented times and this is so weird. So uh, paint me the picture of the macro outlook according to Mark. You know, money printing, which we have at the present time, has precedence. But it's unprecedented that it's coordinated among all the countries. You understand? So uh, there are currency fluctuations, and we'll talk about this in a minute. But basically, if everybody prints money, uh, the outlet is that the money flows into assets and that cash and uh, money that has a very low rate of interest, or actually, in uh, some cases, negative interest rates, this is unprecedented. In the 5,000 years of human history that is recorded, we never had negative interest rates. This is the first time it's a form of expropriation. Uh, Make no mistake about this. It's kind of an expropriation. Or a wealth tax has been discussed in the economic literature. Anyway, and what is also unprecedented and actually kind of ironic. The world was sold to the idea that democracy equals freedom. (laughs) But I can tell you, having lived in many countries and traveled all over the world, I've seen a lot more freedom in countries that didn't have a democracy than what the idiotic governments have done in the Western world nowadays Namely, that is unprecedented, and this is to shut down the entire economy. This is an infringement into people's personal rights. It didn't touch me, so I'm not talking because out of my book, but say someone has a bakery, someone has a grocery shop, someone has a restaurant, a tattoo salon, a barbershop, whatever it is, 
and he is ordered to close down his business by the government in a democratic society. This, in my opinion, is unprecedented and a huge infringement into people's personal freedom. I mean, Milton Friedman, who is never quoted by today's economists, if you have noted, because he was anti-government, <laughs> anti-big government, and anti-intervention. He explained exactly in freedom to choose and freedom and capitalism how a society works, and that the best system is that people take their personal responsibility and are let alone uh, by the government to function as they please. But this is exactly what has happened. Uh, a planned economy, a manipulated economy by central banks, by the treasury departments of countries, and uh, by economists and the politicians. And it's sold by the media to the public as necessary. It's completely ludicrous. I have to say two events happened in my life which I never thought would ever happen. One is negative interest rates, because I started to work in 1970. Treasury bond yields were at 6% on the way to 15.84% in 81. And then they went essentially to zero. I mean, not the treasury bond, but they went close to zero, but in Europe, we have negative interest rates in Germany, France, Switzerland, even Portugal have briefly negative interest rates. I mean, when you think about it. It's crazy. Even, it's even Greece, right? Junk bonds, and essentially. The other thing I never thought in my life would happen is that they would shut down the economy. And basically, they're shooting themselves into the foot because, you know, people grow tired of these government interventions. Yeah, you've talked about this before, but essentially the system is bankrupt. Uh, the only way out is to print more money, bigger governments, yeah. printing just happens forever, the rates are low forever. But I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on these new uh, experiments. Like it, it seems like that things, there's actually a German uh, saying uh, that I learned from Ronnie Stuferle that says when the, when you're, a uh, worldly reputation is in tatters, tatters. Uh, the opinions of others hardly matters. It's in German and I obviously don't know how to say it, but it's this mindset of like, everything's broken. Let's just try something new like uh, MMT. So I'd be curious, I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on MMT? Something like this is, is the light at the end of the tunnel for us. Well, I mean, I think that some form of MMT has been practiced for a long time. I mean, the printing of money is kind of a hidden MMT and also the whole, the, the entire social programs is some kind of a uh, MMT. Now they have used the crisis as kind of a excuse to accelerate the introduction of basic income. And I think the idea, they always talk about the great reset, as it is not a reset, it's a gradual sliding into a totalitarian society where there are some people that will run the world and you and I will have to adjust to this reality. I mean, yesterday I had uh, the visit of a general <laughs> from Myanmar. He is uh, in charge of the border area. He said, Mark, if you like to come, uh, anytime you can come. And we have very strict quarantines here in Thailand, but he flew in from Tokyo and he slept one day in Chiang Mai and then he came to see me the next day with his car. Today he is in Bangkok, tomorrow he's coming back and then he's going back to Myanmar. 
which is crazy. You know, this is the, if anybody this flies is the in, <laughs> yeah, you understand. He's not a billionaire, but by Myanmar standards, he's a big shot. He's a general. I mean, I call him Nerda, and he calls me Mark. But he is in uh, Myanmar, a general in charge of the border area. The different states. He's in charge of Karen. And then north of Karen is the Shan region, and then Kachin. This is up north, where uh, in Myanmar you go up to close to 6,000 meters. That's insanely high. Yeah, I mean, I, I just had a friend uh, go back to uh, Bangkok, and you know, you're quarantined in a basically a hotel that they cater in all the food for two weeks, and you can't leave, and you get tested every three days. I mean. So to have that privilege is 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 something, right? And I think that's that's where we're going as as a government. So that means bigger governments. But you've also you've mentioned, I mean, the U.S. is at danger of losing its global reserve currency status. That, um, but looking at these other governments, these other fiat currencies, they don't offer a good uh, second option right so where where do you see this going gold backed currency what's what's kind of the the end game there this is a very good question i mean when you look at the increase in asset prices since 1981 uh, for bonds and 82 for equities the whole 80s for real estate and for art prices and so forth and so on i think people are fleeing the cash market, in other words, the sophisticated uh, people, they know that the purchasing power of money is going down and down much more or at a much more rapid pace than what the government is telling you with their manipulated CPI index. <laughs> that is a complete joke. Nobody lives by a CPI that is compiled by the government. Yeah, don't worry. Asset prices, I mean, the whole they're, system they're not is inflating. Rigged. But uh, what you have to do, in, in my opinion, you have to have reduce your position in U.S. assets. Just to compare the performance of the U.S. S&P 500 compared to the FTSE index in London. For the last 100 years, the FTSE in London has never been as cheap as now compared to the S&P 500. If you compare emerging markets to, say, the NASDAQ 100 index or the New York Fang index, which also includes Apple, Amazon, Netflix, uh, Facebook, and Google's and Tesla is also in that index. They added it in to boost the performance. Just to make it even more ridiculous, right? <laughs> yes. So if you compare that index to, say, emerging markets, emerging markets are dirt cheap. And this is my view at the present time. You know, we live in a two-tier world. Uh, we have hardly ever had this wealth inequality as we have now. There's a huge wealth inequality between the billionaires, and I'm not a billionaire, but I'm a billionaire in Zimbabwe dollars. <laughs> maybe, maybe the Myanmar local currency too, or yeah. Vietnamese dong yes. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> the dong, yes, yeah. the Vietnamese currency, the dong, yes. Anyway, uh, we have these very wealthy people, and then we have the masses essentially that are struggling. And we have very precise statistics. These are not statistics that have been doctored. Young people today, they earn less in real terms than their parents when they were 35 years old. In other words, say when I was 35 years old, I earned more than say young people today at 35 years. Now there are some exceptions, you know, that, that I have a friend, he founded a, High tech company software. He's a billionaire at thirty two. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean he's an exception, but it's but he's not the rule. And then number two, we the boomers we had the opportunity to acquire wealth because asset prices were going up and interest rates were high. 
Today, a young guy, he has to buy a house. He has borrowings up to here. You understand? He, he can't afford out of his wage to buy out. But maybe he has parents that are generous, you know, and stuff him money at the back into his pockets so he can buy the house. I mean, I recently, or not recently, but for the last few years, I went to a conference in America with wealthy people. And I always I ask, you know, what are your children doing? And so it was, it was yeah, they're doing this and that. And so then I ask them, are you also supporting them? <laughs> yeah, they all bought for them a condo or they pay the rent or something like this. <laughs> you understand? So it's a different world. And uh, I think that the US lost a lot of prestige economically and also politically under Mr. Obama and Mr. Trump. You know what I mean? The world is a bit, uh, after having watched the elections in the US, <laughs> the world doesn't seem to think that it's very wise to have American uh, observers who then judge whether the election was fair or unfair. Yeah, it's uh, this. So this is being recorded first of December, and we've just, well, who knows when this thing will actually uh, end. But I, I mean, these these structural issues. So asset prices all time high as they've been pumped up from monetary policy and and, and quantitative e easing. The debt levels, government and and cons like individuals across the world are at all times high, like we're over leveraged on everything, growing massive governments, we're moving towards these totalitarian. I mean, what? how, how does an investor think through this? Like my logic uh, just says that wealth tax and inheritance tax and these things will, will ratchet up and we'll try these uh, new monetary experiments like MMT, but how does one position a portfolio accordingly? And I know this is the billion dollar question, right? But um, I mean, yes. what's what's most interesting for you in these times? It depends. You see, I'm now at an age where I don't really have to multiply my assets because uh, I'm not sure I can take anything along when I move to another maybe happier or less happy world. Maybe we're all here in hell. Or maybe the earth is already heaven. I, I don't know. Maybe for some people it's heaven and for some people it's hell. We don't know. But the point is, um, for a young person, the best advice I can give is to get education in some field where he becomes kind of an expert and he can sell that expertise to a list of people that need these services and are uh, happy to pay for quality. Say, I look at your house and I see the staircase. In my opinion, it's well built. You understand? If you are a young guy, unless you're kind of a really academically inclined, when I grew up, maybe it was a uh, disgrace to be a carpenter, an electrician, or uh, someone, who, a sanitary installator, and so forth. But nowadays, I think if you're a great electrician and you can put in the electricity wires in my office in such a way that I don't have power shortages or outages, I'm happy to pay for it. Or if, if you can look after my motorcycles or my cars, uh, then I'm happy to pay for it. I don't need another kind of a nutcase <laughs> to advise me on spiritual goods and so forth. <laughs> so that, I have enough. But people that really do something, like I have here a PC, okay, notebook. If anything goes wrong, it's not so easy to find someone who can fix it. Sorry, my dogs are barking. <laughs> it's okay. Because already <laughs> at this time, there's someone who comes home from the market. 
you know, he has a small stall which he drives to the market. Around this time, he comes back. Yeah, it's quite late your yep. time. <laughs> so, and then they, the, the dogs, for some reason, they always bark. Anyway, so, so you see, I, if you have a computer, say, if you know someone who you can call and say, look, I have a problem here. Can you please come over? And he can solve that problem. I'm willing to pay for it. But it's not difficult. It's actually quite difficult to find someone like this. Absolutely. Because the one is specialized in this software, the other one in that software. But someone who can just do simple things for you and fix a notebook, uh, both mechanically and also software issues, uh, you know, there aren't that many that do that. Yeah, and I think I think that's very valid life uh, advice, right? Uh, invest in yourself. This has the largest ROI, especially for young people. But once you start hit hitting that stride and earning these assets, I mean, I'm in the U.S. now after years abroad, and and, and I'm a fan of flag theory and geographic diversification. Own a property in different countries and have your money spread out in different currencies and things like that. But a lot of my friends here don't don't think like that, and they've they've saved up dollars, and they're working for an American company, and they have their four hundred one k in American equities, and they want to deploy this U.S. dollar asset base into something. And you know, for me, I, I'm like, I, where would you? How would you advise somebody like that, uh, knowing what you know? Yeah. That's a great yeah. one. I can tell you something. I remember when I studied, uh, that was like in 65, 66, I went to Spain. And as a student, you don't have much money, but uh, Spain was very cheap for us who came with Swiss francs. But there were American soldiers that were based in Spain. Ordinary soldiers, they lived like kings because the dollar was worse at the time, uh, close to 80% more than it was worse in 1980. After 1971, when Nixon went off the gold standard, the, dum the dollar tumbled by 70% against the Swiss franc. Before 71, one US dollar bought four Swiss franc 40. Or 420. After it's one to one. And when I see this, and that's why I always say, you know, the peak US prosperity for the majority of people, we're not talking about the billionaires, but the majority of people was probably somewhere sometimes in the late 60s, before the dollar devaluation began. And afterwards. Uh, standards of living didn't increase much and the poverty rate didn't go down after uh, the various social programs this Milton Friedman showed very clearly. <laughs> anyway, but I would say anyone who has money and you should talk once to some people that came from Argentina. There's a lot of Argentine people they lost their money, not only once, maybe three times. I have a friend, he launched, he's very smart. He launched a company in Argentina uh, that uh, basically trades stocks uh, electronically. It expanded throughout Latin America. And then he moved to the US and he has a Bitcoin, I mean, a side, a cryptocurrency exchange. His family lost so much money in Argentina through the various devaluations. He told me, Mike, I don't want to have the same situation again. And he doesn't say, you know, you have to put all your money in Bitcoin. He said, just put money that you can afford to lose, maybe 5% of your money or 3% into Bitcoins. We don't know, it could go up a lot. But he wrote an article for me, for my report, but that was two and a half years ago when Bitcoins had gone to 19,000 and then they were back to 3,000. So the timing was very good. 
I'm not sure I would rush into Bitcoins now. But the point is, an American should have some assets in non-US dollars. To have everything in US dollars is equal to trust the US government. Who on earth would trust the Washington clowns? The criminals. The mafia has taken over Washington. It's worse than a mafia organization because they have no sense of honor. Yeah. In the mafia, they have a sense of honor. It's, it's, it's akin to being an employee of Enron, right? And having all of your savings and life savings in the Enron stock. You're, you're, you're tethered to one, Absolutely. one cart. Exactly. And if that thing, yes. and there's always the, yes. put all your eggs in one basket and wash it closely, but that's not a right basket to put it in, unfortunately. But so, I mean, uh, wealth inequality <laughs> is at all time highs, like you said. Um, I, I liked the conversation about Bitcoin. So for me, Bitcoin offers a life raft to uh, hyperinflation and government confiscation, which should be two massive worries for the ultra wealthy. But um, I mean, there's other ways of losing your wealth if you're very wealthy, like wars. I've heard you say wars, revolutions, and plagues, which is very valid. But the wealthy <laughs> doesn't want to give up their wealth, right? So if, I mean, how does... How does this wealth disparity discrepancy uh, work its way at least a little bit more towards the mean? Well, the thing is, uh, uh, the wealthy don't want to lose their wealth, but I've just written two papers. One was about, you know, what is socialism? Uh, I described the theory of Engels and Marx and Sismondi and uh, numerous other the socialist uh, theor uh, theoreticians and then I wrote the anatomy of revolution and this deals with how was it possible that there was a Bolshevik revolution in Russia and especially how was it possible that so many wealthy Americans and especially intellectual Jews choose to support the Bolshevik regime. You, you understand? The initial group of people that was running Russia, Lenin and so forth, uh, they were mostly of Jewish origin, not Stalin. Stalin wasn't. But the first uh, people that were running the secret service that really created these uh, horrible forced labor camps, the gulags, and so forth. A lot of them were Jewish intellectuals or were supported by Jewish intellectuals. And that will always uh, be a mystery to me. But actually, Schumpeter, as you know, he was uh, kind of an ultra capitalist. He wrote about uh, business cycles and he wrote about uh, the corporation and uh, the capitalistic system. And then a month before he died, I think it was 1950, was invited in New York to give a speech. And in this speech, he explains that the capitalistic system is so successful that it will automatically lead to socialism. Because he observed, first of all, the intellectuals in a highly, society, highly competitive society are left a little bit behind. They, they do okay, but they don't become billionaires. So the intellectual class is actually in favor of more in, interference by the government and more in favor of distribution of wealth and so forth. But there are other uh, academics that have said socialism, 
comes out of the capitalistic system as a reaction to it. So that's more Marx Engels. So the difference here is uh, the wealthy people, they think and they support the socialism because they used to be, they think they're elite. They think they will be swimming at the top and that they will be running the show. When in fact, in most cases of a revolution or a change into socialism, it's not peaceful. The ruling class, they get their heads chopped off with a guillotine. <laughs> I have a friend in America, he's built a guillotine. He's built it already, just, just preparing yes. for this. <laughs> he, he's a very good workman. He's built, he, he actually built it for, Hillary Clinton, oh. but <laughs> hasn't been able to he's use a, it yet. He's a great carpenter, but turning out yes. these guillotines left he's and right. He's not only a carpenter, he can fix anything. You know, he's a, he's a great workman. I wish I had these skills. I'm going to put it on my list for sure, because I am not that handy around the house, but rest assured, <laughs> I'll, I'll do another call with you and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll show you something that I p uh, built with my own hands. I, you are good at uh, building stuff. <laughs> no, not yet, but I'll learn it. It's all learnable. Yeah, yeah, you, you can teach yourself, but you know, you have to be careful because these modern tools, you can also injure your hands. Yeah, I like all my fingers yes, where they are. With a chainsaw, <laughs> yeah, with yeah. a chainsaw. If you try to shave <laughs> your beard off with the chainsaw. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, we have this situation and as I said, I think Americans should invest overseas and investing overseas would mean to also own some precious metals, gold, silver, platinum, but then to store it overseas, not in the US. And to own some properties overseas, if someone cannot own a whole property, he can buy ETFs, but I would also diversify the custodian you know, there's, not, there's no point to have all your money in your 401k account and nothing outside the US. Because I've seen con people coming out of Eastern Europe, you know, uh, during the Cold War. And I've seen people when they came out of China in 1945, uh, 1949, the Shanghainese. The Shanghainese, they went principally to Taiwan and to Hong Kong and some went to Singapore and to the US. But anyway, there are two classes of Shanghainese that went out. The one that had some money outside the country already and the ones that had nothing. I had a friend, he was the assistant of a very wealthy Hong Kong Chinese. He was actually Eurasian and uh, he was, his family was the comprador of Jardines, which was the largest conglomerate at the time. Anyway, his boss always told me, his family, my assistant, was much richer than we were, much. <laughs> but when he came out, he had nothing because all the family had all its assets in properties and factories in Shanghai and the region, they had nothing. So he ended up by working for this, uh, not a nice man, but wealthy Cantonese. <laughs> that is the fortunes of life, you know, but these are things you can think about and prepare. I have friends, they actually left the US physically and they're also getting other passports, especially young people. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of this flag theory, uh, multiple passports, ownership spread across different jurisdictions. <laughs> I'm, I'm fighting against the tide. I, I've been outside of the US for nearly a decade and I just moved back for the first time this year. So I think I'm, I'm somehow reversed this whole idea, but you know, it, it is what it is. So I, I think we're, we're on this unavoidable yes. march toward socialism and redistribution of wealth. So for Americans, for US people, I get it, foreign asset holdings, foreign brokerage, gold, land outside of the US, 
but I, I, I need to research this more, but it actually seems like the whole world is moving toward this socialistic uh, state, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> or they're even further along on the path, I mean, uh, than, than the, we are at the US. So, I mean, do you think the whole world's moving towards socialism? Because I just received an email today from someone from Eastern Europe. I can tell you, people, they will never want to go back, never. It's only spoiled, woke society in the Western world that is dumbed down, that wants to go to socialism. Because they have surveys in America, uh, surveys that show the young people, 60% think the government should do more to support them. They want socialism. They are against the capitalistic system. Capitalism means freedom. Socialism means you're going to work like in a factory, check in, check out, no freedom. Yeah, this time it's different. Maybe it will work out really well this time. I suppose that's what everybody's thinking. It's going to work out much worse because uh, in the past, to be fair to all the forms of government, if he did a bad job, he got killed. Uh, Chesterton, the English novelist, wrote already a hundred years ago. The most surprising fact is that so few government officials go to jail. Yes, I agree. Nobody of the bureaucracy goes to jail because they all protect each other. Well, you said earlier they're they're like anyway, a, they're like a I, mafia, I right? Say, I think uh, <laughs> yes. I think. Uh, Americans and also other people, uh, they should definitely own some assets overseas. And, uh, you know, also some assets in cash overseas, because maybe the dollar goes down much more than we think. I'm very bearish about the US dollar, by the way. I think there's no way out for the US dollar not to depreciate. Now, can it go up for a week or a month? Uh, who knows? But the trend, I think, is down and hard, tre- down hard. And two, I think US foreign policy has to change and they have to accept the fact that the world is a different world than during the Vietnam War and uh, during the early part of the Cold War. The U.S. is not any longer a superpower the way they were relative to the rest of the world before. We have in our countries like India and China, their economies are in some sectors much larger than in the U.S. They're also larger than in Europe. Do we cry in Europe about the fact that China is so much bigger than Switzerland? We live with it. We sell them what we can and we buy from them what we can. Our job in the world is not to play the policeman. This is a big misunderstanding that the US has, that they try uh, to be the policeman and that they kind of have the belief that they're better than other people are. Yeah, well, I mean, we've enjoyed this this reign of us being the, the global number one and we're competitive and we need to win and all these things that uh, it permeates through all of our society. So it, uh, it's very valid. I mean, Britain was also number one. And to be fair to Britain, they aged well. London is still one of the most desirable places for foreigners to live. The British courts are very good, very fair. They treat foreigners the same way they treat local people and so forth. So I think they're no longer a superpower. I mean, if Britain went to China in 1842, they destroyed the army in a day. And then China had to give, oh God, the British. (laughs) Today, this would be a little bit different. (laughs) They They would. not even enter the Chinese waters. <laughs> hmm. It's true. I wanted to ask one more question about like a foreign real estate investor. 
what what other economies would you look at? Because I know a, a lot of them are just as bad or worse. So where would you start your search and why? Yes, uh, a lot of economies today are maybe in a worse shape than the US. That uh, is possible. Whereby we would have to analyze, you know, why is the US better off? Maybe it's better off because they printed so much money. Uh, maybe it's better off because they have this, uh, in the last 12 months, over $3 trillion deficit, fiscal deficit. This is obviously not sustainable in the long run, and other countries may not have that. We have to be very careful in the analysis of that statement. But one thing is, of course, true. The stock markets of many regions have tumbled, whereas the indices in the US are in the sky. I can also argue many stocks in the US have tumbled and the indices are in the high, because we have this dual market, these diverging performances between high tech that is in the sky and popular and overowned, and we have depressed stocks that just made a historic low, say oil, uh, basic industry, steel and so forth, aluminum, copper, and uh, banks. You know, so the, there are stocks in the US that are inexpensive and there are stocks that are very expensive. And the same in the US, stocks are expensive and elsewhere in emerging markets, they're not expensive, they're cheap. There's some markets that sell at three, four times earnings. Uzbekistan is one, Iraq is another one and so forth. So there are opportunities. Actually, I think today, there are lots of opportunities for the value investor. Because you understand, value is created when all the money flows into a popular sector. Say, in the late 80s, all the money flowed into Japan. It created value elsewhere. In the year 99, 2000, all the money flowed into the dot-com bubble. They created value elsewhere. And at the moment, we have the same situation. And I think there's a lot of value in uh, equities. The, the people will say, well, they have problems. Oil will not be popular and so forth. They've said that about coal for the last 200 years. <laughs> and we still use coal. Change is harder and, and slower than you think, right? 70% of uh, electric power is generated by coal. So anyway. And uh, so this is a sector I would look at, emerging markets and also depressed stocks in the U.S. Awesome. Well, Mark, really, really appreciate you taking all the time and, and being on here uh, so pleasure. late your time. Uh, I think you've shared some really, really valuable insights that I know my listeners are going to love. So uh, I, I don't get up early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. You, you need your sleep. I mean, it's it's important, right? So. Where, where can my listeners find out more about you? I'll be linking Gloom Boom Doom report and everything in my show notes, yeah, but where would you like to send We have a website, gloomboomdoom.com. Perfect. Mark, thank you so much. It was a, it was a pleasure. Real I'm honor. I'm sure it's worth finding out more about me. So maybe <laughs> avoid me. No, I'll link everything. You're, okay. you're a legend. Thank you so much. There you go. First off, Thank you very much for listening all the way through. I hope you got a lot of value out of that conversation. As always, you can find show notes, links, and more at altassetallocation.com. Please share this with anyone you think might be interested and derive any value from this conversation. And as always, you can reach out to me for any feedback or questions. Please give the video a like, or even better, subscribe on YouTube or your podcast player of choice. This really helps others find the podcast or the video as well. Thanks a lot. Hope everybody has a fantastic day and stay safe out there and invest wisely. Cheers.